Let's stand for the reading of God's Word, which comes from Acts chapter 13, this morning, beginning at verse 4. Speaking of Paul and Silas, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, And he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. May God bless our time in his word. Please be seated. A long time ago, (laughs) in a galaxy far, far away, Now, as good Christians, I'm certain you've never seen that movie. So in case you haven't, that was Star Wars from Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back, Lucasfilms, 1980. From the time he first slithered into the garden in Genesis 3 to when Cain murdered his own brother, Abel, in such a cold, calculating premeditated fashion, to untold centuries later when a new pharaoh came to power in Egypt and issued the order to throw every Jewish baby boy into the Nile, to a time later when a king named Herod flew into a paranoid rage, ordered the slaughter of all the infant Jewish boys under the age of two near Bethlehem to some 30 years later when Jesus is led into the wilderness by the Spirit himself and someone was waiting out there, waiting for what he obviously hoped would be a repeat of what happened to the first Adam. And when things didn't go as planned, he simply disappeared and he regrouped until, as the scripture says, a more opportune time. A more opportune time like the night when Judas agreed to betray Jesus only to realize afterward that he just sold his very soul for some silver or to the upper room when unknown to anyone other than Jesus, there is this mysterious specter who is quietly seeking permission to sift Peter like wheat to the next day when the mob requires that Barabbas be free, Jesus be crucified, and Herod signs the execution order thinking he has finally washed his hands of Jesus. At each and every point along the road of human history, in sometimes obvious, blatant ways like uh, mayhem in a state farm or an all-state commercial, He gleefully goes about his work of wreaking havoc in people's lives. But more often than not, he prefers to carry out his ancient trade in much subtler, unseen ways. He lurks in the shadows and works behind the scene, S-E-E-N. He is the master of deception, the father of all lies. He can even transform himself and masquerade as an angel of light. Pleased to meet you. Hope you've guessed my name. But what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. 
the Rolling Stones, Sympathy for the Devil. We are in the middle of a sermon series in Acts entitled Mission Impossible. We're examining the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. Uh, We have examined the empowerment needed for the mission. Last week we looked at the discernment for the mission. Today we're going to look at opposition to the mission. When we encounter opposition or spiritual warfare, when the prince of darkness, grim as Luther called him, goes on the offensive, when the ancient empire of the evil one strikes back. And we're going to examine three aspects in this passage. One, the reality of the opposition, also the reason for the opposition, and lastly, the result of the spiritual warfare or opposition. It's not a question of if, it's only a question of when. Because this empire always, always, always strikes back. This empire always strikes back. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of this time and place in your word. Be honored, glorified, break through the things that bind us. And change us, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. The reality of spiritual warfare or opposition. In Matthew 16, Jesus said this, I will build my church and the gates of hell or Hades will not prevail against it. But what Jesus said does not mean that the evil one and those who belong to him sit idly by and they do nothing. In fact, we see this all the way through the book of Acts. There is this thread that is woven through the book of Acts where every time the kingdom of Christ moves forward, the kingdom of the evil one pushes back and sometimes pushes back very, very hard. So, for example, in Acts chapter 2, when we read about the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls on the crowd that's gathered there in Jerusalem, and we're told some 3,000 people were saved. In fact, at the end of that chapter, it ends with these words, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Big setback for Satan. And yet almost immediately after that, we read about Peter and John being hauled in before the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the day, and they're threatened not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus something they refuse to do, so they're thrown into jail and threatened once again. In Acts chapter 6, we are told that the word of God spreads and the number of disciples continues to increase rapidly, in fact, including a large number of priests who become obedient to the faith. Again, another major setback for the kingdom of darkness. And the very next thing we read about is Stephen becoming the first martyr of the church. And the church is persecuted and it is scattered because the empire strikes back this time with a vengeance. So that by Acts 9, Saul's running around breathing in murderous threats against anyone who belongs to the way. But if you know the story on the road to Damascus, he meets the resurrected Jesus and the rest, they say, is history. So that by the time we reach Acts 13 in this passage that we looked at last week, the church in Antioch, through its worship and prayer and fasting, discerns the Spirit's leading, and they set apart Barnabas and Saul, or Paul as we know him, and they go out on what we commonly refer to as Paul's first missionary journey to Cyprus. The text says they sailed for the port city of Salamis on the island of Cyprus. Doesn't mean much to us, it's sort of biographical uh, filler, but in the ancient world, uh, folks then regarded Cyprus much the same way we regard Hawaii or the Bahamas. It was the place in the sun to go. Sort of like Michigan in January. That's why all the hotels are so cheap this time of year. Who in their right mind comes here for a vacation? 
And so they enter the port city, and you can almost hear the Beach Boys in the background singing, Aruba, Jamaica, oh, I want to take you, Bermuda, Bahama, come on, pretty mama. That's where we want to go, way down in Kokomo. Any illusions, however, that they are on some vacation cruise on, to Fantasy Island on the USS Love Boat we're, are short-lived because as they travel around the island, they begin preaching the Word of God. We don't read of anything notable until they get to Paphos, which was the capital city of the island. And as soon as they do, the evil one strikes back. The reality is that the, the opposition, though, at least in the beginning, is not obvious. It doesn't look like opposition at all. And yet the spiritual battle is just as real. It's just harder to see or detect or discern. What I mean is that while they're in Paphos, Paul and Barnabas will meet two governmental officials in the providence of God, two very different kind of people, two different people with two different plans, priorities, purposes, interests, goals. One, they meet the proconsul, the governor of the island, a man, a Gentile named Sergius Paulus. The other we meet, the other man they meet, is the proconsul's chaplain, his chief spiritual advisor, a Jew, known as Bar-Jesus. And when the arranged meeting finally takes place, the external beauty of the island is stripped away to reveal this underbelly that was not immediately obvious. If the old adage is, don't judge a book by its cover, Paul so soon learned you shouldn't judge paradise by its palm trees because the golden paradise called Cyprus had a serpent slithering around. That's the reality and hence the reason for the spiritual warfare and opposition. They meet the proconsul, the governor of the island. He is a man of great power, great authority. In fact, he reports directly to the Roman Senate. And as such, he holds absolute military and judicial power over the island. He is the governor of the island, and so from a pragmatic standpoint, meeting this man in God's providence is a great thing. It's just a smart thing. He can open doors for you, not only on Cyprus, but throughout the Roman world. This is a picture of my grandfather, my Grandpa Saunders, uh, who uh, in this picture is in his late 20s, um, he, at this point in his life, was a young widower. He had buried his wife, my grandmother, uh, in uh, Scotland. He left his infant daughter, my mother, with family, and he immigrated to Canada. And he spent some years bouncing around looking for jobs and a place to live starting a new life. I found two letters in his personal belongings. One is handwritten, the other is typed. The first, and they're both dated in 1928. So it tells me where he was at that point in his life. Uh, the first one handwritten from Excel, Alberta, a little village in southern Alberta, if you're Canadian, eh? <laughs> to whom it may concern. This is to certify that John Saunders has been in my employ and I find him an A1 man and sorry to lose him. A letter of reference. Very important when you're looking, you're a stranger in a new town looking for a new job. The other one is typed. It is uh, from the constable, the chief constable of the provincial police department uh, in the same date almost. It says, to whom this may concern, this is to certify John G. Saunders, who has lived in our district since May of 27, is considered by all who know him to be a very honest and trustworthy young man. A, an official letter of reference, and they're folded up. He had these in his wallet. Why? 
because these open doors for you when you're new in town. Meeting the governor of the island in God's providence was a very, very good thing. And yet, God has other things that are far more important because what the text says is the governor was seeking to hear the word of God. Whatever else the other reasons for the meeting were at that time, whatever Paul or Barnabas thought the meeting was set up for, God knows that this man is a seeker of spiritual truth, which suggests for all of his power and his status and his wealth and his influence, he has this God-shaped hole in his soul. He's longing and desiring for more. And so he summons Paul and Barnabas to a lunch, which is a clue the Holy Spirit is already at work in his heart. And of course, then there's the governor's chapel and his chief spiritual advisor, a guy named Bar Jesus, who to borrow a line from Winston Churchill, uh, was a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. He is a man in his own right of great reputation. The fact that he has access and knows the governor says he's someone of great influence and apparently he's used his influence for evil in the governor's life for some time. His name, even his name, Bar Jesus, which means son of Jesus or son of salvation, is deceptive. Perhaps he claimed to be a descendant or once met Jesus influence. And as such an heir to Jesus' magical powers, we really don't know. But we do know he's a sorcerer claiming to know the way of salvation. But that's a lie as well because he's also known as Elemis, which means the skillful one. Skillful at what? Skillful at miracles and powers skillful as a sorcerer, a magician, a wizard, and that's why he's also called a false prophet. We know because he's Jewish, he would have been knowledgeable to some degree of the Old Testament scriptures, but we also know he's a false prophet who then would take those scriptures, claim to speak for God, but have no real actual connection with God, even though everyone else is impressed and believes that he obviously does. He is like the Balaam of old. He looks the part, he knows the lingo, all the right religious sounding buzzwords. He has the title Rev in front of his name. He wears a clerical collar, a ministerial robe. He wears a cross, it's so big you need a forklift to carry it. And he can quote all the Bible verses backward, forward, chapter and verse. But he is a sham. He is a religious con artist. He's a flim-flam man. He looks and sounds religious, but he's not righteous. Which is why Paul makes it very clear, and Paul understands through the, the, the discernment of the Spirit, that Bar Jesus, underneath it all, is opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So on one hand, Paul and Barnabas are trying to draw him toward the faith. The proconsul is seeking the way of righteousness, and Bar Jesus is pushing him away at the very same moment. So, on the surface, you see, for Bar Jesus, there's this great loss of power and influence. I mean, if the governor becomes a Christian, uh, Bar Jesus is out of a job, quite frankly, and he has no more influence. Underneath, there is all this spiritual warfare that is going on because the darkened empire of the evil one is striking back. Jesus talked about this very reality in the parable of the wheat and the tares. And if you're familiar with that, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you are, it's the story of how a farmer plants good seed in his, in his fields. Why? Because he wants to have a crop, a good crop. What he doesn't know is during the night, somebody comes in and plants weeds, tares, noxious plants that at best harm the crop, at worst 
It destroys it. It makes it worthless. And so at the very moment, the Holy Spirit is using Paul and Barnabas to plant the Word of God in this man's heart. At the very same moment, the evil one is using Bar Jesus to plant weeds of doubt, to steal the seed, to keep this man in darkness and in bondage and in slavery to sin. It's a conflict as old as the conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the evil one in Genesis 3. And it is just as deceitful, which is the very word Paul uses in verse 10. Again, on the surface, it all looks like this nice ecumenical religious discussion over a polite lunch, having a Bible study at the governor's office. But as the discussion progresses, the Holy Spirit gives Paul the spiritual discernment to see through the veneer. The reason for the spiritual warfare and the opposition? It's not merely because Bar Jesus will lose a job or influence. It's ultimately because of the evil. The evil one knows that the eternal well-being and lives of, in, of innumerable people, their souls are at stake and they hang in the balance. It is as the prophet Joel understood, there are multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, and the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. It is because the gospel of Christ and the gospel alone, when it is applied to people's hearts by the Holy Spirit, has the power to save people, to free them, to change them, not only now, but forevermore. You see, which is the reason why the apostle does what he does and says what he says, which brings us to the results, what comes out. At some point, Paul confronts our Jesus. And of course, what he does and what he says in that text wouldn't fly in our culture where niceness and tolerance and plural, pluralism are not just virtues anymore <coughs> to strive toward. They have become rules from Mount Sinai and they are carved in stone. We live in a day, I don't, I don't think this is any shock to you, we live in a day where people, uh, telling people the truth, even if you're nice about it, is now hate speech. But Paul as a prophet and filled with the Spirit of God, discerning what's going on. And by the way, Paul is someone who used to do the very same thing, a man who used to do the devil's bidding, he of all people understood what was going on because he once persecuted followers of the way. He of all people knows what's at stake here and what he needs to do, which is why, by the way, the text makes it very clear to tell us that Paul is being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so as Paul is being filled with the Spirit, he speaks. It's not an error, he's not venting his spleen. He knows that the salvation of this man is too, too important. So being filled with the Holy Spirit, he turns and confronts Bar Jesus, maybe better said he confronts the one who is behind him using him. He uses words like deceit and fraud, calls him a son of the devil, not a son of Jesus. Why? Because it's actually true. The truth is that Bar Jesus, despite what he looks like on the outside, is not a good man. He is an evil man. He functions almost in an antichrist type of figure because he's doing the opposite of God's will resisting the spirit. And unlike John the Baptist, who went around trying to turn people from the crooked path uh, that they were on and walk the straight way and follow Jesus, Bar Jesus here is trying to turn the governor from the straight way back to the crooked woman. And much like Elijah of old, when he called down fire from heaven on the false prophets of Baal in his day, Paul does the same thing to bar Jesus. And yet, even in judgment, even in the harshness, God always remembers mercy. Even in the judgment, there is mercy and grace offered. We're told that bar Jesus is blinded for a time, temporarily, 
For Paul, this is like deja vu all over again because it's reminiscent of the day when he had a personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus and he was blinded for a time. And why? So in God's grace and mercy, he would have the time to ponder and consider his eternal well-being and come to faith in Christ. So the text leaves this question open. The question is, how did Bar-Jesus respond during his time of physical blindness? Did he seek forgiveness and freedom from his sin, or did he just later go on his merry way as so many people do and walk in his darkness? We really don't know, we're not told. But what we do know, and what we are told is left to the very last verse. You know why? So we would not miss it. Where we are told that when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. Because he was amazed, notice, at the teaching of the Lord Jesus. He came to personal faith in Jesus. By the way, uh, Sir William Ramsey, who was a great New Testament scholar of archaeology uh, back in the 20s, I think, uh, he, uh, one of his works, uh, tells of how inscriptions have actually been found bearing the name of Sergio Paulus, uh, his name on Cyprus, confirming that he became a Christian and that many in his own family became Christians. Which, you see, brings us full circle to where we began. Where Jesus said, I will build my church. I promise you, I will build my church. And I also promise you that it doesn't matter what the evil one does. The gates of Hades will not be able, in the ultimate sense, to prevail against it. And to the day, just like the day of Pentecost, the Lord Jesus was still adding to the number of his church daily as those who were being saved. The reality of the opposition, the reason for the opposition, and the result of the opposition itself. I'm going to ask our musicians to come. Uh, if you're an elder and you're here I'm, here, I'm going to ask you also to come down to the front. We're going to sing in closing as part of our worship a uh, song. Uh, My Chains Are Gone, it starts with the old familiar lyric of Amazing Grace, written by John Newton, who understood what it meant to be freed from his bondage. But then it adds the refrain, my chains are now gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love, amazing grace. Now before we do that, lest I forget, I remember the day God did that for me. Forty-five plus years ago now, it was a time in my life when if you had asked me if I believed in Jesus, I probably would have said, sure. But in truth, there was no reality, no power. There was nothing behind the words. So how about you? The question is, can you sing this song as a testimony of faith in the Lord Jesus and what he's done for you? And as you sing it, does the song ring true as you do? Because if not, then the question becomes, would you like to be changed today by the power of God's Spirit? Maybe you're a Christian, but it's been a long time since you and Jesus talked honestly about things. By the way, if you're here and you're wondering what the struggle is that's going on inside you right now, that's the reality of the spiritual battle. And the reason for the struggle is because your very soul, your eternal well-being hangs in the balance. And the result and the outcome, humanly speaking, depends on what you do and how you respond to the Spirit's prodding in this moment. So come. Come and get it right with God as we sing. And our elders are more than willing to pray with and for you. <laughs>